All right, welcome everybody to episode two of SFF Addicts for our very first author panel. And I'm very, very excited for the guests that we have today. Uh, first off, we have Hugh Howie. He's the world's first author sailor hybrid. Um, although I think Herman Melville probably probably was as well. But I'll, I'll give it to you, Hugh. I think I think you deserve that title. I think and- L. Ron, Ron Hubbard was probably the most famous uh <laughs> Sailor, sci-fi writer. He does not count as an author, though. <laughs> he's, he, man, Battlefield Earth is amazing. I recommend uh, it to everybody. He's if a messiah. If you don't start a cult after this, I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> There's money in it. Um, all right, well, Hugh is the... He's mostly known for his best-selling novel, Wool, uh, book one of the Silo trilogy. And his expansive bibliography includes a ton of books, including the Molly Fied Saga, Dust, Sand, Beacon 23, and a whole lot more. Uh, now his success as a writer has given him the chance to embark on a journey across the world, uh, his second dream being sailing. So hitting the waters and writing books, and Hugh's life sounds very dreamy. So welcome, Hugh. Thanks for joining us. Thanks. I don't know how dreamy. I'm, I'm in a hotel room in Vegas right now, so. Well, <laughs> that's, that's still a good dream, being able to travel around and write books. Thanks. Yeah. Well, thank you for being with us. And our second guest is Duncan Swan. He's a living melting pot of cultures. Hello, sir. <laughs> South African born and raised, Kiwi immigrant, Australian citizen, and now he's a permanent resident of the United States. Citizen. Um, I'm a citizen now. I got it. Bravo, sir. Well done. So, congrats. I've added that to my list of places. So. <laughs> his uh, volume one of his debut novel, Monster, was released last September and is described by Duncan himself as sci fi with claws and teeth. Or if Alien, World War Z, and Generation Kill had a three win, a very dark place, which I think I is an, a very, very nice description. I so welcome. That one. <laughs> but, but <laughs> all right, it, but it works. <laughs> it's very macabre, but I like it too. So welcome, Duncan. Thanks for joining us on the panel. No, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. And third up, we have my co-host, Manny Henri, joining us from Quebec. How are you doing, buddy? I'm very, very good. And I'm going to yeah. do you. You don't have to introduce me. I introduced myself in the intro. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you all for being here. This is our panel on self-publishing and SPSFC, which is the self-published science fiction competition with Hugh and Duncan, who are both the co-founders of the competition. And uh, we're going to dig in that, into that a little bit later. But first off, we're going to talk to Hugh and Duncan about their, about their work and, and how they developed as writers. And then we'll get into self-publishing and finally into the competition itself so you guys ready to go born sure ready. Yeah. all right cool well uh hugh first off how's your current lifestyle uh how's everything going for you right now that's going good um you know uh there's a pandemic uh still going on so uh everybody's dealing with that but uh it's been a lot different than i thought it was in all my post-apocalyptic writings um <laughs> a little more a little more uh posh and the hairstyles aren't as cool as I thought they'd be. Um, uh, Something I realized really early on that all these um, like Mad Max things get wrong is like how much care people put into their hair in those films. And uh, (laughs) what we really saw was just people's roots grown out. You could tell how long like the pandemic been going on by how, (laughs) how far the dark roots were (laughs) everywhere. So uh, um, yeah, learning a lot from this pandemic about writing the next one. But yeah, things are great. I've uh, been writing a lot and uh, working on some adaptation stuff. And uh, yeah, um, that's about it. And how do you feel personally about, about having your work adapted? You don't have to tell, I, you don't have to divulge too much, but how do you feel about the, the, the sheer act of it being translated to the screen? I'll divulge anything. You got to ask me any, I'll, I'll uh, go for it, man. Yeah, I'll talk about anything. Um, uh, I think it's amazing. I'm not precious about my stuff. I started letting people write fan fiction in these worlds and sell it, you know, a long time ago. Um, so uh, I, I'm more into the collaborative storytelling tradition, and uh, don't uh, no one's going to change the book. So I think every medium should have its own opportunity to tell the same story in a different way. So I've been like the I think the dream author for a lot of these. Uh, um, producers who worry about you know upsetting I me. Mean, I'm the one in there in, in the room saying like let's change this drastically, and everyone's like whoa, let's like kind of stick to the material a little bit. Um, so I, I yeah, I think it's super exciting. I assume nothing actually ever gets gets made, but now we're 
uh, a week for principal photography on uh, on wool. So uh, as I was saying to you guys earlier, if it's gonna, if the world's gonna stop it from happening now, it's gonna be an interesting, uh, it's gonna be fun to see how fate engineers that because we're getting pretty close now. Yeah. But I still don't believe it. I'm not gonna believe it until I'm like watching it on TV myself. No, but I mean, it must be amazing to be part of the process. And and for you, you sound like the type of author who's more interested in having like a conversation about their work in the sense that your part of the conversation is what you wrote, but someone else's part of the conversation is a TV adaptation or, or fan fiction or something along those lines. Yeah. What I've learned from, from this and working in a, uh, I think like three different writer's rooms now is that that's where I was, um, I was meant to be like writing books. I can do it, but it's painful. Um, I really enjoy the social aspect of uh, working on a TV show or a film with a bunch of other creative people. It's so much, you, you, you like, you look forward to going into, uh, to write every day. And uh, with books, like I get it done and I uh, can make the process interesting to myself, but like just getting started every day is, is uh, really difficult um, compared to like sitting down with a bunch of other people and tossing out ideas. Uh, like I'd much rather be doing this with you guys than sitting here talking to myself on camera. It'd just be boring. <laughs> I mean, I don't know what you'd be talking to yourself about, but same stuff, exact same thing. <laughs> just telling everyone about the wool TV adaptation, but just alone. No, more in, of the, the stuff that we're talking about before we started recording. Just like <laughs> I'm going to show you my starfish. Yeah, more more poop jokes. More butt talk. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah, yeah, we're all adults here. Just so everybody knows, we're adults here. <laughs> One other cool. thing that 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 I think we're going to make the connection to a little bit later on is about it's about the fact that you publish this independently as opposed to you know take the path of traditional and now you you have a show and it 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 started from that that place where you you started writing you know novellas and and then people caught caught to it and then it became this big thing and now it's a show that that I only can see the the connection from that and now the contest that we're going to be talking about later on it must be like like there must be some pride behind that as well you know i what i i'm just such a huge fan of of creative people um in every kind of art form and i just love watching people do um uh, stuff that they're passionate about that makes other people happy like when i see people playing an instrument or singing or dancing i just get such a thrill out of it uh it took me a while to realize that it was like such a, a huge uh um love of mine that i uh because it, it's you, you know you have to compare yourself to other people to figure out what makes you tick and i realized that like i just geek out about people having talent especially if it's talent that i don't have um i see this as a huge opportunity for these writers just to get a handful of more readers and potentially hundreds or thousands more but for me a measure of the success of, of this, which um, I can't wait to talk more about the contest, especially get Duncan talking about this because he's been such, he's been like the driving force behind this whole thing. Making and he's going to change. Go. No, but like, it's incredible. And it's going to change some, some people's lives is what I, what I hope. But like, I, I just want to hear that like one of our finalists or our grand prize winner gets this uh, optioned or makes a bestseller list or, something that that might not have happened to them otherwise just because of this extra exposure um that's what happened to me really early on i got like a handful of fans and reviews that increased my exposure and changed the trajectory of the success of the series and uh if if that can happen for one or two people every year that we do this then uh what a thrill but i i think what what we can learn from andy weir and um myself and some of the people that have started self-publishing and then got uh, either book deals or film deals or TV deals is uh, you're not you're not closing yourself off by choosing how you publish uh, every path the the outcome requires a miracle no matter which way you go but the miracles are about the same in every direction I don't think uh, there's a guarantee in any way but what we've shown is that when someone says well if you do that your career's over we can just ignore those people they're uh, they're trying to spread misinformation and uh, they're talking about their own fears or experiences, but I think we just need to like, you know, champion the, the positive potential uh, and, and, you know, let people know that chances are 
swim no matter what you do, but the chances are still there. And that gives me a lot of um, uh, hope when I write a new piece because nothing's guaranteed, but I always think, well, the sky's the limit for this. Mm-hmm, for sure. Awesome. And, and that kind of pessimism, if it sort of seeps its way into, into things like this, it, it tends to manifest and, and accumulate like a virus. You know, it, if there's more positivity, if there's um, a sense of com- camaraderie amongst the science fiction community, or in the case of um, uh, SPFBO, the fantasy community, it's people boosting other people. And if there's good work and if there are people who say, that's awesome and I really like that, and they push that out there, even if it's a single tweet or if it's a blog, uh, writing a post about it or reviewing it or something along those lines, that that kind of positivity is enough to propel someone who might be writing for might be writing for fun or might be writing for a hobby. It might be enough to convince them that I want to do this more seriously, and then they go further to create more awesome creative work. Absolutely, yeah. Well, um, Duncan, we'll we'll jump over to you just to see how sure. you're doing and how's That's life. Good. Life is uh, life is good. Um, I mean, same as you and and, and Manny mentioned. Kind of the, I'm glad we're coming out of this COVID thing because um, I'm a dad to a two year old, which meant I've basically been trapped indoors with a terrorist for the last year or so. <laughs> um, yeah. and it's it's nice to see the sunshine and other people again. Um, so no, it, it yeah, it's uh, and I also happened to launch a book at the beginning of COVID. So it's been a very weird last two years, year and a half. Um, and then, yeah, I managed to, I managed to rope you into this competition. So I've managed to keep myself busy. So things are, things are looking millhouse. I'm going to put it that way. <laughs> well, I think it's good that you're, that you're staying positive, even though you have a terrorist. Um, she, she's a cute terrorist. It's okay. It's okay. Oh, dominating your days. You've managed to keep busy and you've managed to, to do some good things in the meantime. Sounds like you have Stockholm syndrome. I think she's cute and stuff. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but no, I mean, it, it's no, she, she's lovely. It's just, yeah, it's been, it was an adjustment. I'll, I'll say that much. Um, you know, especially when everybody's been trapped indoors and you don't have childcare. I mean, even the playgrounds around here were closed. So finding a patch of grass was a challenge. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my son was born last year during the pandemic and it's been, it's been a weird time. I mean, Thankfully, we have a backyard, so so we got a big patch of grass out there. But I think the social aspect is something that's a bit, yeah, um, yeah. a bit lacking. And and we took him to a playground for the first time, uh, I think a week ago, which was weird. It was a weird experience. Everyone's kind of looking at each other, like, "Did you touch that? Should I touch that?" <laughs> yeah, but then no, you I realize think, your kids think, licking that... the handle anyway. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> just a little. I try. Jerk. I try. <laughs> Just little like germ mops. They just touch mm. everything and it doesn't really matter. And then it goes in the mouth. So Yeah. Yeah. But now she got very good with hand sanitizer. It's amazing how much they pick up. I'm like, going, we're going sorry, off tangent of books here. But um, you yeah, know, I, I I feel sorry for some of the families that had kids a little bit later in the COVID kind of period just because their kids weren't being socialized whatsoever. Um and you can see it. You can see it in playgrounds now. And I'm not that I'm an expert, but you can kind of pick when the child kind of came into the world and therefore <laughs> didn't meet anybody for another year outside of their parents. Yeah, but that's true. A bit of an adjustment period still going on now. Yeah, their social skills are a bit stunted. And we live in, I mean, I live in LA and we live in Playa Vista, which is like this, uh, what's that? Stepford Wives kind of suburban perfection, you know, manicured lawn kind of area in LA and nothing else in LA exists like it. And it's also where basically everybody comes to reproduce. So there's kids everywhere. (laughs) (laughs) This baby is everywhere. It's like a spawning. It's like a spawning site. Honestly, (laughs) it literally is. And then you know, people kind of like tap out after two kids, and then they move on. And then the next bunch of pregnant ladies move in. That's where the idea of monster came from, right? No, no, no. (laughs) (laughs) just what end the end the world in darkness because of the child. Yeah, no. no, that, that came that came like six years ago in Australia still, so I can't blame it on the Stepford Wives area. <laughs> well, actually, speaking of monster, I think it's a good time to to tell us a bit more about that. Sort of introduce your work and and a great book, how you've way. good transition, Manny. Yeah, good transition. Yeah, good transition. Um, and just uh, tell us a bit about how you 
developed as a writer and and how you came to be um the person you are today in terms of in terms of an author you don't have to tell us everything. still developing as a writer so i've got one under my belt and working on number two and number three is like the messiest draft you can imagine um but oh. so i used to work I used to work in finance. I'm going to say that just before before quitting, because I've I'm now basically balls to the wall, all in on writing. Um, and I used to work in finance, and I dabbled in writing basically since I started. And I realized half my brain was atrophying, um, so I started. I just started writing in an Excel sheet in some of the cells. So <laughs> when if, if anybody looked at me, it was in Excel. So I would just not really notice what the paragraph was doing, but I know it was saved in that history, so I could kind of at least exercise in my fingers and be my brain and and, and that's how, brilliant how, oh, yeah. it, it was hit and miss because <laughs> it became hella hard to manage and then you'd have to extract it from each cell and anyway can't you just take that cell and then say make a series and then does like a 10 book series out of it or something oh yeah just, oh, you prob- just copy it down <laughs> you probably can do it i have you seen his excel skills it's it's like yes i have it's well, amazing if there anything I, i've retained here from i <laughs> My I don't get impressed experience. easily technically, and when I saw his Excel sheet, I was like, "Oh shit!" And yeah. flowcharts, and man, I've... I, I do like a chart. I do like a chart. <laughs> well, well, I mean, we it's helpful tell. for SPSFC. Yeah, it's... It helps, yeah. That's yeah. Very, yeah. What's it? Pictures worth a thousand words. I mean, and I've been a lot of puns all throughout here, but um, <laughs> no, it's uh, it. I had been kind of dabbling, and then. I, I was reading, uh, so I started working, I was about 28. I did an undergrad and then I did a master's and then I went into finance just as, a, as the GFC hit. So I've had some interesting luck. Um, and basically, as soon as I started working, uh, Brent Weeks came out and I started reading Brent Weeks. And then I kind of stumbled across his website and stumbled across his Q&A, which I thought was incredibly uh, informative in terms of how authors are real people and you know, authors have lives and they kind of sit at home and they don't, you know, they don't just appear from underneath the rock. Uh, so he humanized the process for me, but I was also very much still only considering the, the traditional route. And then you know, uh, our little crime lord here, Hugh, kind of popped up on the scene and I read his wool and kind of it, it opened my eyes to maybe there's another route. Um, so I literally have him to thank for, <laughs> thank blame. I'm not sure which one it is yet for, uh, for, for trying this avenue and so far, it's working. Um, we'll, we'll see when number two and three comes out, but I'm, I'm kind of glad I did the jump because we've got nothing ventured, nothing gained. And finance exactly. finance was just, it, it was okay, but it, I'd had bigger dreams and I couldn't see myself realizing them in a, in a cubicle. No, I think it's well, better I think that you have you the right, branched out. Yeah, you, yeah. you have the right attitude about, you know, uh, to have the success you've had with your first book where you're where people are reading it talking about it is uh absolutely insane to me because like uh what, what surprised me was that people like it i think that still surprises a first-time author is when you you invest this much time and effort in something and it's, it's entirely living in your head and maybe you know your significant others read it and maybe a few friends have read it and maybe a, a couple of beta readers and your editor but then the wider audience in the world world it kind of gets exposed to it and when your average score is a is, is a high pass or a pass, you you kind of have that validation that you didn't have before. So that's, I think that's the most. I take that more than, um, more than people talking about it, but people liking it. The fact that people are talking about it is, is an added bonus. Yeah, it's fantastic. Um, yeah, because like you, uh, you typically have to put several things out there before one of them gets any kind of traction. I think the the authors who have their, you know fourth, fifth, sixth work kind of start uh, going crazy or, or have some advantages because they've been able to have all this time to write and not think about the promotion and everything else. I think that's and then there's a back true. catalog that's yeah. selling once something yeah. starts hitting. I think yeah, that's, that's what... it's the back catalog because I've got, I'm getting a lot of emails, which is a great thing as well. People sending emails to authors is still very new to me. Um, half of them are, you know, are full of praise and the other half is like, when the hell is number two? I'm tired of waiting. So it's... yeah. Yeah. Guilty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Manny. <laughs> My, yeah. You haven't sent me. You should send Manny a draft of the book, second book. Three, three, three uh, weeks ago, I I'm, was. I'm screaming. hoping. I'm hoping to have the draft kind of wrapped up by November, December. 
and then then I'm definitely going to be peppering people's inboxes. Can you yeah, wait I'll until see. then, Manny? Can you I, be patient? I was, I was screaming two, three weeks ago, where the hell is number two? Like, like how can you end this way? I was like, <laughs> I was, yeah. Manny, anyway. he's not George R.R. R. Martin. Who the fuck do you think you are? Just wait. <laughs> <laughs> he's a monster. I, my, my craziest story about that is um, I, I uploaded a book one time and went to sleep and I like hit publish and uh, said something on social media like just hit upload. Uh, you know, there's such a great feeling finishing a book and you've got at least one night where you can go to sleep and you're not thinking about your plot and mm. your typos and all that stuff. I went to sleep and I woke up in the morning and there was a review on the book. Someone had downloaded it like in Australia and spent took all day off work, spent the whole day reading it and then wrote a review and then emailed me asking when the next book was going to be out. And I had just woken up thinking like, I've got like nothing on my <laughs> to do list today, blank document. My first email is like, loved it. When's the next one? Oh, just, <laughs> was that Duncan? Writing it yet. There's no oh, winning. So. Was that Duncan? No. No. I've no. <laughs> Duncan never emails me. Are you kidding? I just, I just tweet at you and. Yeah, you do it all publicly. Yeah, I do it all publicly. <laughs> no, I th- actually funny it. funny story. I think I did email Hugh, but this is the this is the the same trap, and he's written posts on it since then, and I myself have learned since then. But you, especially considering he was like uh, he was the the trendsetter or the pathfinder, I was like, you know, what are the secrets? And it's it's you can't condense it in, in an email and ask a person how they found success for yeah. themselves. Like everybody has to kind of, which is what I found. Find your own path. A find something or somebody that you can that you admire and you can attempt to emulate, but you're really gonna have to do it your own way at some point. Yep. Um so no, I mean I, I joke that I get emails about people liking my work, but I don't I don't get emails that I imagine Hugh would get, which is solve my life's problems and how do I be like you kind of thing. So <laughs> I never get those. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna send you one tomorrow. Well, I think it's really interesting to to hear your side of the story, Duncan, in terms of how you entered into the self-publishing scene a bit later on and how you viewed it as an outsider before you came into it. Whereas mm-hmm. Hugh, um, you jumped into it much earlier on. And so you obviously have a different perspective, but how, how was it for you? Um, you know, maybe introduce a bit of your, a bit of your work and how that initial uh, introduction to the self-publishing world happened. You're asking Duncan, right? I'm asking you. Oh, you're asking me? <laughs> yeah. Well, so I think it's inter- it is cool to have like two people coming in in different eras because I think it changed a lot between my first self-published work and Duncan's. Um, and uh, I think both of us had some advantages and disadvantages by doing it at different times. Mm. Um, when I did it, everyone just told me I was a complete idiot. I still and, got that. Uh, Don't worry. That's still that's still valid. Yeah, so that's that's good that that still happens. Uh, and that's, everyone should get hazed that way. But I had so many people who had a lot more experience than I did in publishing tell me that if I did this, I would never have a career as a writer. And uh, um, there was no there were no precedents to point to to say like, hey, this is what's possible. Instead, I was just I I felt in my gut that what I was thinking was correct, and I had everyone who knew anything about books and publishing telling me the exact opposite. Um, so that, I think that was a disadvantage, uh, when I was publishing myself, but the advantage was that not very many other people were doing it. So we kind of, um, had a a lot of the landscape to ourselves. And I think the barrier to entry and what people would tolerate out of eBooks back then was much different than today. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did my own cover art and it was awful. And you don't see cover art once you start reading it on the e-reader and people were clicking on it on Amazon anyway, and just getting past that initial gag reflex when they would see uh, <laughs> the cover art. And, uh, and I, I don't think, I don't think most, most of what I published would have had any success if I did it today. Uh, but I would have also been less miserable with my decision to publish. So um, I, I don't know, Duncan can speak to what it was like for him making that decision, but he at least probably had some interviews and some mm. sales history from other people and things to look at. Uh, but he also, you know, it was publishing on a day when, you know, 5,000 other people published their books that day. Yeah. Saturation. Saturation, I think, is probably the yeah. biggest thing that's changed. And and the ease of uploading a book and having it. I mean, granted, you, uh, I'm, 
even for the people that invest in an editor, editor and formatter and a cover artist, et cetera, you're still dealing with just sheer volume um, that you somehow need to differentiate, differentiate yourself against and, and you know, r- rise above or some, have something that kind of puts you as, a, as an outlier. Um, but then, like kind of you uh, alluded to, we've had all these other people go through it beforehand and, and give good examples to either follow, ignore, what worked, what didn't. Mm-hmm. Um, how can I change what is already happening? Or modify it so that it's it's you know it suits my personality or what I my, my strengths lie to. Like I personally don't blog, don't think I ever will blog. I attempted to blog, sound too much like a narcissist, so I stopped. Like I just I, I don't like talking about myself, but I very much enjoy the visual aspect of storytelling. So I, I kind of like dived head on into the art aspect, and I try to surround myself and work with artists um, to to create visuals, etc. And I've approached most of, therefore, my journey through, you know, what, what's the first um, introduction people are going to have to me? Is it, is it a website? Is it a cover? Um, is it a piece of concept art that they found on Pinterest that somebody's pinned because they liked? I mean, you know, sp- spread my net as wide as possible in something that I think that I understand and something I think I've got an eye for, which is not traditional training in. Um, and then, yeah, it's, uh, I'm also kind of a bit of a, a data nerd. so. When I don't know who you, who you did it with you, but there was a guy a couple of years ago who was doing a bunch of sales analysis on your Amazon sales, and I, I, you blogged about him a couple of times. I forget the details, but we break was, down. Uh, we, we ran that website, Author Earnings, together. That's the one. Uh, That's the one. He went by Data Guy. Uh, he was staying anonymous, and people could attack him. Really? But uh, okay. it was super controversial when we started first publishing those results. I was going to a lot of book conferences back then, and mm-hmm. I had. Uh, people in, in publishing like you know pretty high up in, in the big five at the time uh would just come up and just be you know angry and, and traditionally published authors who were just really upset Interesting. at um at us trying to kind of like i don't know let some people bypass the pain that they went through to get published i think yeah. i still see some of that out there today where people feel like they should have to pay their dues but uh yeah he he did all that work on his own and then just we, we launched a website uh, together and blogged about the results in order to try to get people a glimpse of what was happening in the in the mid list of self published authors, which mm-hmm. there was very little data on at the time. Is this Still is, little data. is this how you guys first met? Is this is this when you guys got to kn- to know each other? I don't get a answer that. I think we we've only just. Uh, become uh close through working right. on SPS FC together. Was that sorry, was that a Hugh question with the data guy or was that a Hugh and me question? I think it was a you and me question. Yeah. Oh so yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um you know that yeah that, so that that's an SPS. We're still in our we're still in the infancy of our romance. We're anyway. not even holding hands yet. It's pretty disappointing. <laughs> no. Just right. gazing longingly at each other. Yeah. It's, it's, it's like it's like eye, an, eye contact is huge for me. It's, a, it's that <laughs> meme where he's walking with a girl and I'm walking behind and he's looking back <laughs> over his shoulder. Um, no, it, so obviously I've been following Hugh's story for a long time, but then last year when I was getting ready, so I, I published in September, and as I was leading up to that, um, SBF, SBFBO, self-published fantasy blog off competition, probably not a competition I added that part. Um, was being hosted for the sixth time or was it the last seventh? year was six yeah last year was six yeah um so that popped up on my radar and i'd also only just started started twitting and twatting um which is where i basically got exposed to it and following reviewers and and i realized hell this is a really nice idea like this it's it's run by somebody who i've read their books and like their books and i really like this champion of self-publishing and it's it's giving lots of exposure to books that i wouldn't have known of i mean jumping ahead as well but one of the one of the reviewers actually i think it's you guys or fanfi uh introduced me to michael r fletcher who is it's probably us yeah i think it was you guys <laughs> we're big yep. champions of michael r. Fletcher. <laughs> we've been um, talking a lot about I'm this pretty guy certain, no, i'm pretty certain it was you guys so yeah i, got, I saw his cover and i was like that looks interesting and i realized he was a finalist and then read his book and I thought this is spectacular so i've read his whole catalog now except for his most his no oscar groans um, and then there was an SBFO Twitter thread with Mark Lawrence and him kind of chatting. And I was like, oh God, do you guys know if there's a sci-fi version of this competition? Cause it sounds absolutely spectacular. Yeah. I would love to enter in it. And Mark's like, no, 
Um, <laughs> I think he was a bit busy. <laughs> and, and, and Fletcher was like, no, but, you know, I would love to be involved in it, but I'm not famous, uh, famous enough and nobody cares who I am. And I was like, ah. Oh. And then I just left it. Sorry, no, I lie. That's this year. Last year, Mark just said kind of no. And then this year, it popped up again. And Fletcher was in it again. And I was like, okay, so seeing you around a few times, you know, I would love to do a sci-fi one. And he, he said, no, he would also, but he's not famous enough. At which point in time I went, well, I think I know somebody who might be a famous enough, be possibly interested. I just have to annoy him. So I, I tweeted at Hugh and I said, uh, is this something that you might be wanting to do? And, and luckily enough, he said yes. And since then, That's we've been amazing. making it up as we go. Uh, but so far, it's going pretty well, I think. <laughs> well, I, yeah, I mean, except there's a there's a flaw in your strategy here. Like you wanted this to exist, so you could enter a book into it. Then you I know, I know, it. I know. It disqualifies yourself. So. <laughs> and I actually um, asked him that question: Are you going to enter? He's like, "What? No." <laughs> no, he asked me the same thing, and I was like, "I can't." I, like, I, I wish this. I conversation- thought he should hmm. put a different name on it, and like, and not don't even tell me about it. it. Like, <laughs> just totally like put, put a make French it blind. Line. Yeah, the the a- problem is, I think it's 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 now. It's been visible enough and spoken of enough that people would read it and instantly know this idiot's just renamed his book in his own competition. Yeah. What a dickhead! Yeah. So no, I, I I didn't go that route. Um, and you know, someone yeah, would I, pick it up and say, "Alien, World War Z." What's this rip off? You know, somebody's ripping up your book. Generation Kill. What? Well, this it has a French shit. name. I could have put familiar. my name on it. It would have worked. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it's yeah, it's it's one of the like what Catch Twenty Two, but in the in the same breath. I'm creating something yeah. with, with a whole bunch of people. There's 59 reviewers. Um, so there's what, 60, am I forgetting when you want 59 reviewers plus you and myself, 61 people working on this from scratch for free for the love of books and self-publishing mm. and sci-fi. And, um, you know, Hugh and I have already spoken about this, obviously, you know, rivaling the Hugos and the Nebulas one day just for self-publishing. So we have lofty goals. Um, and it's something we want to do every single year. So it's, um, in my eyes, it's win-win. I mean, I, I've because I'm like most authors on, on Amazon, I view my KDP on most days. I can already see it's had an impact, so I'm, I'm not complaining. I, no, I mean, so far, the response has been really good. And yeah. honestly, I think after so many years of SBFBO, there are a lot of people who think, where is the sci-fi version? Well, yeah, that, you know, that, there needs to why, be there needs to be the champion of sci-fi. Just I was convinced it existed. That's why I was like, "There's no way that I'm that this this isn't out there." I just don't know what it's called. You know, mm-hmm. Clearly, somebody with more uh, experience and knowledge will can, you know point me in the right direction. And apparently, at least in the US, we might be one of the you know first mover advantage kind of groups competitions. Mm-hmm. Well, and I think well, it's really once again we talked about positivity earlier and just sort of spreading the message about sci-fi that you like. And if there's an opportunity for people who are starting out with their first book or, or one of their first few books, and they don't really have the, the self-confidence to, to push themselves out there as, as a full-fledged author or anything like that, or maybe even go towards traditional publishing, mm. there's this competition that offers them the opportunity to say, fuck it, I'm just going to put it out there. And, and if people like it, they like it. But then there's reviewers like us who are looking at those books and saying, this is actually really good. And then give that encouragement and yeah. feed back into the industry some positivity that it really needs. And it's, it's also that exposure that, as far as I can tell, because I haven't done the route, is, is possibly the only real big advantage of going traditional is that they've got a big marketing machine behind you. Yep. And they will ensure... If they think your book is good, and if they think you're going to earn out your down payment or your advance, that they'll put you in bookstores enough to at least recoup costs. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas, you know, for your self-publishing guys, you, you you are on your own unless you can find champions or people that will share your message, or you know, reviewing groups and bodies and bloggers and and booktubers who you know, rave emphatically about how well you wrote X Y Z. Um, so competitions like this, I guess, is another way for kind of that exposure to come through, and also remove the stigma of self-publishing like the the quality yeah. you know if you look at the the books that that win sbfbo or if I, i'm all this every time <laughs> <laughs> SBFBO. Is, our, is, our, is, our, is our 
Jay, I feel like we should. SPSFC is way easier to say. I think it feels like it's easier to me as well. So so we have have, have, have a build that. My trick for SPFBO is to think of sunscreen and then I can at least start it. So it's like SPF and then I just do the rest. Yeah, nice. yeah so I have, to, I have to think of sunscreen in order to, <laughs> to get anywhere with it. But that's actually a really good jumping off point. Um, Duncan, what's your, what's your take on as far as what you've experienced, but also what you've witnessed before you even entered the industry? And then Hugh, you can jump in after. What do you think of self-publishing versus traditional public publishing in terms of maybe drawbacks or, or any kind of comparisons that yeah. you can think of. My biggest two, three, four factors, maybe three, four, uh, <laughs> time, uh, ignoring luck. I mean, you're going to need luck in both, uh, right? You, like you, you're just going to need luck and timing. You know, is, is the market ready for your book? Does, does the reader, reviewer, editor, agent, whatever, whoever's reading your book, see the potential in it, et cetera. So, um, but ignoring that, I think the, the bigger detractors for me for self-publishing was just time. Like you write a book that could take you four years, five years, three years, whatever it is, and then you submit it. And then you might sit in a slush pile for three years, unless you know somebody who's on that editor's desk. And then it might take, I don't know, another three years before it might show up on a shelf. And it's this... From, from start to kind of possible payoff is a decade to even know if people like your work enough to continue doing it. Um, and the other catch to that as well is you, you sign over, you know, you sign over royalties and you sign over creative rights uh, to not just your print media possibly, but to, you know, your movie, TV rights, et cetera, any kind of adaptation. And then in most parts, at least recently, the advance that you get I don't know what they were in the past, but I know they're not necessarily significant now. So it's what's the what's the payoff? And I always always looked at it, which is why I didn't do it for so long. Is if I'm going to take this huge huge risk and invest all this time and effort and pain and blood and suffering and research and research, why would I? And I thought of it as like a relay. You know, why would you hand over the baton at the finish line and say you finish it for me? Right. Um, yes, mm. it might take me a little bit longer. I'm going to have to learn marketing i'm gonna have to learn branding i'm gonna have to find you know uh, 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 traditional publishers will also go here's your cover here's a cover artist you like it and then you go i i I like it i guess whereas (laughs) self-publishing you can really be as involved as you want or when the more involved you are the better it is i think in the long term but you can go shop around for people that what we try to do is because my wife and I consider this as a business is basically find people and, and skill sets that we don't have that can then complement this if it was a business and, you know, if, and, and kind of go all in in that regard. Um, was that two points or three points? We're at You're still in the first point. I'm still in the first point. <laughs> no, I'm just messing with you. It's okay. Just keep talking. Time and money. Making make you have to think even deeper. Time or money Hugh, and you, you jump in for a second if you, if you have some comments. Uh, I, I, these are all points I agree with. Um, I think the time is a huge one. Um, I, I kind of had it as a goal when I started off to write for about 10 years and do two books a year. And I thought after 20 novels self-published, I would know if I have a chance of making a career at this. And that could be what it takes to put one book out, um, go the traditional route. Um, and, uh, it only took, you know, uh, three or four years to figure out that I really liked this and could get a handful of readers. That didn't necessarily mean that I was make a career out of it, but I realized that I enjoyed it, would do it the rest of my life, and would be happy to have the dozen or so readers that I picked up along the way. Um, and uh, I think some of the advantages, like getting into a bookstore, are nice, but like I was working in a bookstore when I started self publishing, and I realized that books in a bookstore sit there for three to six months and then they're gone unless they become a perennial seller, which is almost never. So that advantage, I think we oversell it to ourselves as, as aspiring writers. We think that publishers are going to post in a bookstore will be there forever. Uh, even if they distribute the book, not every bookstore will order a copy. More and more people are finding their books online mm-hmm. or at very small footprint bookstores, like in airports, you're never going to get in there unless you win like five lotteries in a row. So um, a lot of the things that we say are advantages uh, aren't big enough to make a difference. And then, of course, advances. Um, 
again, working at a bookstore helped me out that I was meeting all these authors coming in to give talks. And I, I found out they all had day jobs. They all taught creative writing somewhere or, you know, had some other career. Cause even if they were winning awards and hitting bestseller lists, they were making $50,000 every uh, year and a half to three years. Yeah. And uh, you can't live off that. And they, you know, yeah. no health insurance, no benefits, no paid vacation. So uh, the more I learned from inside the publishing industry, the more I realized that the things that we hold as advantages aren't that great. I, I eventually started seeing going the traditional route as it used to be that we call it self-publishing vanity publishing or vanity presses mm-hmm. um, because it was all about the vanity of seeing your book in print and you'd have to buy you know, 5,000 copies that sat in boxes in your garage and you sold out of your, the trunk of your car and that was uh, all money that you paid. And once self-publishing became practically free, which uh, you can spend money on it, cover art, editing, and, and you should if you can afford it. But if you can't afford it, I was did everything myself uh, for years. And all the pagination for print books, all the uh, ebook formatting, all the uploading, the cover art, everything I did myself. Um, so it is possible. It's just uh, it's just hard. But the the finances don't preclude your ability to get your work out there. And then I realized that the vanity publishing was no longer self publishing. The vanity publishing now is traditional publishing. Um, going with a big publisher became uh, like a, a badge of honor for authors and something you aspire to, not for financial reasons, but because people would take you seriously or you felt good about yourself. I One of the crazy things for me was uh, being with, I think I was, we were at Random House and they were offering me all this money for, for wool at the time. And I was turning them down because my sales were better than what they were offering. And at the end, when they realized they had no financial um, uh, motivation, they said, but wouldn't you love to say you're published by Random House? And that's when I realized like, oh God, it really is a vanity press at this point. Yeah. They're, they're, they're admitting it to me. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, things have, things have changed. And I think uh, we shouldn't look down on any, a uh, path to publication, unless it's like a total scam or something that's totally author unfriendly. Instead, we should just uh, talk about the pros and cons and let people know up front like what they're doing. Because if if you want to be with a traditional publisher and it and it means taking a lot longer and finding an agent and um, maybe not even making as much money, but because you want to see your book at a bookstore for a little bit and it feels good to be have the validation of a publisher, it's not nothing wrong with those motivations at all. Um, I just think it's good for people to understand what to expect out of each, each path and for yeah. us to encourage all authors, however they choose to publish. And I think the blog post that you did um, about the financial side of self-publishing is the kind of thing that obviously there are publishers that get pissed off about that kind of thing because it's kind of pulling the rug from under their feet where they realize you know, their business model exists on, like you say, the veneer of, of, of name recognition of being pushed into bookstores, all that kind of stuff. But when you see the financials of a lot of self-published authors and they're killing it and they're doing a really good job and obviously they've had to put up a ton of work, but they've accrued skills that they need in order to, to navigate the market. And Obviously, the big traditional publishers, they take care of a lot of that stuff, but they also take away a lot of the choice. Well, you're, you're paying for it. I mean, you're paying for that skill set. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But That's... for you to, to show the financial side of it is to give people a window and to say, this is possible to do on your own. It's not necessary that you need a big publisher to, to push your stuff out there. If you believe in it and you think it's awesome, you know, obviously now we have SPSFC and SPFBO. But I nailed it, didn't I? <laughs> that was impressive. <laughs> Duncan just gave me the the most cheeky slash impressed look, so thank you for that. <laughs> Anyone watching video will see that. Um, I think that that is more um, welcoming, and it reduces the barrier to the industry yeah. in a way that that so many people neglected the potential of what they could do just based on the fact that they thought I can only make it if I go to one of the big five. Yeah. And well, the it's, other it's thing daunting. You- like you're trying to, and, and he's been doing this and I think we'll continue to do this with the competition and, and, and people like us talking these things, but you're just trying to peer, peel that, you know, that veneer away and 
kind of look at the workings that go on underneath. And I think because you're self-pub, you have to kind of wear a lot more hats. We we'll become more vocal about it, and we uh, champion. You know, it's it's not something you have to basically give up control of. To in the, in the hope that you know you'll you'll find it big with a traditional publisher. It's just a question of I mean, both are going to hurt, and both are going to take time and pain and uh, investment. But w one of them, I mean, you know, both need luck. So why not? Why not bet on yourself as opposed to uh, another company that will not necessarily keep pushing your books long term as once you've once you've earned out of a contract you know you'd, that might be it for you you might still end up going self pub route because you just didn't have as good as sales or you weren't you know you weren't front of shelf in a in a big bookstore um, and then you're still also you know left to your own devices to organize your own you organize your own blog tours and reading events and it's it's very much a it seems to be very much a hands off kind of traditional route anyway. I think I think what's shocking for a lot of authors who finally get that traditional uh, deal is that their marketing relies on you anyway. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of this, I don't want to do any of that stuff. If you say that to a publisher, you're not going to get signed. Uh, even when I was doing deals, like and to this day when I do deals, publishers want to know, you know, how many Twitter followers you have yeah. and what your yeah. What are your marketing plans and how are you going to get the word out? They rely on their authors. So um, it's, it's such a fantasy that there's a career out there where you write a book and hand off the manuscript to someone else and you don't do anything else. Like there's, there's work involved. And I think we shouldn't um, lionize or celebrate authors who don't learn all these other things. Like even I do a lot of traditional publishing deals, but like why would you be an author and not be curious about how books are put together? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, every decent painter knows how to stretch a canvas on, you know, like screw a wood frame together, stretch a canvas, gesso it, um, how to control, like what, what color lighting you want to present your work under, um, to, you know, light temperature uh, is something that artists who actually take it seriously, make a career out of it, understand. Um, and uh, why would the same not be true of books? Like if you don't know what kerning is as an author, then you're you're dabbling you're not you're not taking you know, how are you not interested in 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 books as an author so uh i think we should just encourage the 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 whole publishing uh cycle and let people geek out about um uh you know what what trim sizes are and the history of of different book formats and what windowing is and all these um the more you learn about publishing the more fascinating it is and that it it there was a long time where self publishing was the option, and what people did they they financed the publication of their own books and uh, did that for hundreds and hundreds of years. And uh, the history of publishers is is really fascinating. And why they set up in New York in order to grab these newspapers coming from overseas and steal, uh, uh, you know, basically plagiarize uh, serialized works and stuff from from uh, uh, wooden ships. Like there's just uh, it's such a good story. It's crazy to miss out on it. But I, I think it's fantasy that um, anyone's going to have success in this industry without knowing how to market and promote themselves and have relationships with other uh, authors and industry professionals. It's just all part of the game. Yeah, and I think even regardless of whether you go traditional publish publishing or in self-pub, there has to be, like you say, Hugh, this sense that we're going to geek out, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean you have to be multidisciplinary in every single facet of the publishing process, but to understand at least different aspects to the point where you're fascinated by it and you're interested in it. And this is everything that goes into creating this thing that you're putting out into the world. If you're not passionate about that stuff, then it might not be for you. And if you know the history if you know the process involved in creating a book <clears throat> or the process involved in, in creating a book cover or converting, converting a file into an ebook format or anything like that, it's just, it, it, regardless of, of what profession you're in, it deserves the attention and the passion of whoever's involved to actually know the intricacies of, of that. I think, that art I think that's also a good indicator of whether you can keep doing it is if you don't mind the administrative stuff that, that surrounds it and to you it's interesting as opposed to a chore. Mm -hmm. 
Um, because, yeah, I mean, I love going down rabbit holes that have nothing to do with writing, but have to do with publishing, etc. And sometimes I'm like, I spend way too much time not writing, but I don't mind these other these other tasks, I guess you could say. Knowledge, knowledge bites. Well, in that sense, do you, obviously, this is kind of um, steering into, if you're a self-published author, in reality, like Duncan has said earlier, you're a business. And you have to sort of think of yourself as an artist and a creator, but also as a business and promoter and marketer all jumbled into one. So for both of you, Hugh and Duncan, how have you sort of balanced that, that creative side versus the business side? Duncan, you go first. Well, I started on an OnlyFans account just to kind of, <laughs> no, um, uh, let's talk about that for a second. <laughs> Duncan, you, why are you not parlaying the fact that you're like the handsomest guy in publishing right now? Like, I feel like you should have more of a, more <laughs> give, of a, give me, I'll be on today. Baseboard presence. Today, USA. I'll be on the morning TV shows at some point. No, um, <laughs> no, that, but you don't like, want to go you on that crap. Now everything should be YouTube with you and just like the, com- the front cover should just be your face. And then the t- you know how the back of a Harlan Coben novel is just like his big bald head. Oh no! Um, <laughs> you should put that on the front. Monster, I, I, monster, I volume Duncan, two. Duncan, I have with something Duncan's to show face. you. This is one of my favorite authors, and oh, he's okay, not. Hand- I, thought you, I thought you dug up something else from my past, but you didn't. So I'm okay. She got some nude photos of you. <laughs> They're somewhere. out there. They're probably out. <laughs> this is one of my favorite authors. He's not handsome, but look what he does with his books. That's it's, our boy William. That's, that's, that's brave. William Duncan, that's brave. He needs a cat. That's I've got my cat. That's what you should do. That that uh, William Gibson, that's... he oh, fucking owns who he is. Yeah, you gotta know your. You need to do the same. Well, yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, if, if the next book. Can you imagine I slap myself on the back of? No, it doesn't even. I mean, this is this is this is my book. I don't think I belong on the back of that. So you're being you're being too humble. Uh, I I think I will look for the next I'll, 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 I'll have signed poster full length body shots of me and it'll be autographed. Have it like as, a have it like a have it like a mid book like plates. a spread, you know? So you book can plates. just unfold it. Book plates with signatures. <laughs> or you can you can, okay, you can unfold but, it from the middle of the book and then and then it's the book just is free. Out. The book is free. The book plate's five hundred bucks. I see. I'll make a business doing that instead. No, but all, all joking aside, I I found a lot of success from. Um, from letting readers be a part of, of mm. my life, like um, connect with me on Facebook and, and Twitter and on the blog. And uh, and then I realized that I've, I'm the same way as a consumer. Like when I can have some kind of connection with the people who make the stuff that I enjoy, it makes me enjoy their work even more. Like yeah. it's uh, it, it augments it. And so, you know, earlier, Duncan, you were just saying that you, you feel narcissistic about blogging. Um well, I think okay. you have to get. I think you have to get over that a little bit. Maybe because I mean, I've attempted it. It's more just I. I, I did, at least at the, at the time when I started out, I definitely didn't feel knowledgeable enough to even begin to write about writing because I was still learning how to write. So I felt yeah. I felt like any advice or viewpoint that I gave was going to be so narrow and biased and anecdotal that it's going to be irrelevant. So to continue writing blog posts about it, as I'm, what I'm, I'm just repeating myself at this point. Um, so yeah, I it's maybe I mean narcissistic's the wrong word. I just it didn't I don't write easily in blog format, whereas I can create a world and that to me is flows more easily and it's something I, I want to do as opposed to you know, pick a topic and, and write about it and see how many blog views I get. It it, it doesn't yeah, it's not something that I naturally gravitate towards. I yeah, admire I people you. that do. I mean I wouldn't be here were it not for you blogging. Um, but I think maybe I can give value back in some other way. So, or maybe, definitely tell, do that. or maybe tell your story. I mean, when you and I met the first time, you were talking about how you got inspired by some movies, or or what, who, which artists actually did some monsters, and mm. that kind of fulfilled the, the the front front end of your website and that's and actually actually that's how i got inspired to read your book i saw all the designs of the monsters that was, that was the idea that was and the idea. i was like oh shit i gotta read that this is a great well, lead way because i loved i loved uh what was the name of the tom cruise movie you mentioned um edge of tomorrow edge of tomorrow oh my God. I, would, I love that movie i, I love in years i, I love that movie too. 
I thought I was going to have a heart attack in the in the theater. What's, what's great about that film is if you hate Tom Cruise, you're going to love this oh, movie. Exactly. Nice over and over again. Whoa. It's, great. it's rewarding in every level. You nailed if, it. If you love Tom Cruise the way I do, then it's just great because he's because like he looks stupid a, for half the movie. He, and he goes, but he goes from like being a slump <laughs> to like kicking uh, ass, a world savior. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I love that film. My favorite part I saw about it that movie. Times in the theater. My favorite part about that movie is it's essentially Tom Cruise running more than he's ever run before. And that man can run so well. He runs so he well. <laughs> so maybe you start oh, doing that on your blog, like telling the stories behind behind what inspired you to write Monster or what are your struggles with writing the, the or third blogging. volumes. Or... What I, did, I, did a, I did a bunch of interviews, funnily enough, which are on YouTube somewhere. Uh, but I did a bunch of interviews for the book launch where I basically spoke to the people that kind of helped me through the process, like my editors, because I've got two. Um, a whole bunch of artists that I worked with, the designers, like I worked with a designer who did uh, a bunch of like uh, alternate covers and then I had them help me with my website, etc. cetera. Um, and so it's kind of, I'm much happier picking their brains about their process and, and kind of trying to work out how they work so that I can work with them better next time. And it's all been this lovely learning process. Um, like even just when we first started, it's a question of how do you do the title in a book, and then what font do you choose, and then how do you do yeah. an author tag, and what is an author tag, and um, how do I brand this so I can use it in all my books, and so that it, you know, it, it will sit in that genre that I want to continue writing in. Um, but yeah, I did a bunch of interviews with them, and that was fun. I'd love to revisit it, but uh, yeah, I think I think YouTube's probably been the best the best invention in that for me. So for you, potentially, in terms of the business side of things, you found more success in not necessarily blogging because that's not really that's not really your thing as as a way of promotion, but more so that you found finding the right people to collaborate with has been your your best tactic from a business perspective. Yeah, and and also, I I'm personally a visual person, and when I was creating Monstre, it's a very much in it very much lived visually in my head, and I thought, hell, it's a really interesting world. I would love to see it. Um, the odds of seeing it on the big screen are pretty small. I mean, Hugh can attest to the journey to get to this kind of point. Um, but I'd love to see art about it. And I think, uh, what a destiny, the game had just come out and they did a big push with concept art. And that's the first time that I remember of AAA studio really spending a fortune on concept art that was then publicized, if not more than the game. And that's what the game basically was marketed on. Um, and I don't know, maybe I was 20 or 30,000 words into Monstry at the time. And I thought, why don't when books do this? And they don't do because it's expensive. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I was like, well, this is going to take me a few years anyway. Why not, as I go, chip away at kind of building a catalog and, and finding artists that I think would nail a specific sk skill or a specific style, whether it's, you know, uh, matte, matte painting or if it's a 3D ZBrush sculpt or if it's uh, uh, a graphic novel cartoon art style um and then kind of you know have them as as posters for a book and have people maybe stumble across it that way and just hook your interest and then have them have them wanting to find out more and i kind of then gravitated towards that and put most of my focus on that and that's therefore what i use the website for i'm like you need an author website which i was get continuously being told but i was like i don't know what i'm gonna do on it like you know i didn't want to blog but what can it be a home for that then still sells the book and sells my vision? And it, it, I've kind of tried to interlink them and, and use the business aspect that way. So, you know, it's, it has a usage um, and it's something that I'm already interested in. So now I just need to find better mm -hmm. ways to display it. And uh, yeah, the, the art's the way that I've gone for this and hope to keep going. And um, my, my, my biggest question is, once I'm done with Monstre, what do I write next that lets me keep doing what I'm already enjoying and, and continue to use the people that I've got good relationships with now? No, I think, that's really, I think that's a really good approach because what you're doing is using the, the self-publishing um, sort of world as a launching point for you to bring your different passions together. You happen to find that your passion for art worked really well as a collaborative and, and marketing tool for, for the book. Yeah. And you got to work with some really cool people at the same time. Yeah, I've worked with some amazing people. I mean, far more famous than I am. Um, and, you know, they've they got some great credentials. Like I work with one, 
I work with guys who work for like uh, Sony, Sony games, etc., or work for Mar- you know, Marvel as their biggest clients, etc. So I've got these amazing people in my corner who I can kind of t- tweet at now and. It's like Cerno de Bergerac. One person does the writing, and then the other person does all the marketing, and they're the face of the partnership. And that, uh, yeah. I would have totally picked someone like Duncan just to like do all the PR and be the face of the thing and the and the sexy <laughs> accent, and I'll just do all the writing. The confused accent. The confused accent. Jeez. Well, actually, it's interesting. I was talking to my wife recently about um, just the, all the author interviews that I've done and sort of my introduction into this world, and realizing authors are generally I can't I can't generalize this overall, but for the most part, in terms of my experiences, authors are super nice people, very humble, and you're new to this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can tell. You, you haven't met Stephen no, King yet. I'm just, I'm just optimistic. <laughs> I'm just optimistic. But anyways, the... Have you, the, have you met Gary on Twitter yet? <laughs> no, I've met some people on Twitter, though. Oh, Jesus. But um, there's Speaking a really... Twitter, that's, that's, like, that's like the the audible impersonation of Twitter right there. (laughs) But there's a really interesting parallel between a movie and the people who create a movie and then who becomes the face of the movie is different. Whereas for a book, the person who created the book isn't necessarily the face of the book. The book itself is the face of the book. Um, So there's this interesting parallel between who looks at a book and thinks, ah, that looks interesting based on the cover, but then they look at the author's name and they want to look at the author's face or something like that. It doesn't really connect in that way. What what hooks me on a book, or the author of the book, is literally the acknowledgments at the back. That's often the most, you know, kind of revealing a part about the author that you're reading. Are they gracious? Are they, you know, are they complimentary? Do they acknowledge the journey? Do you want to come back and read more? Um, I think, yeah, I mean... I'm always very interested when an author includes a picture at the back, but I'm much more interested in, in what they actually say in the acknowledgements component. So mm-hmm. I didn't know anybody read that part. I always read them. I've started, no, I, I didn't, I lie, I lie. I started reading them after Brent Weeks, fanboy him for a bit as well. He read, uh, was it his Knights, Night Angel, Night Angel trilogy? Is that the one? Don't. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe. Anyway, I think it was his first <laughs> book and I read his acknowledgements <laughs> and I was like, okay. Because he, he, I wish I could remember what he said as well, but I felt it was really heartfelt and interesting. And I was like, wow, this is a real person. Um, let me go find out more. And that's, that's what clued me into actually going and researching the guy and finding his website and then regularly going back for updates. And I don't think he even had a picture on the back, but yeah, it was the acknowledgement. So now I kind of make it a, an extra effort to read what people have said at the back, especially considering I've been through this journey as well. Um, you, you kind of don't know. Now that, you've, now that you've said that, I want to write like the most self-centered, obnoxious acknowledgement. Uh, I just like I'm just acknowledging myself in every way possible and taking full credit. I'm so happy you know, for me. Will. I deserve this kind of thing. Everyone's yeah. going to think, man, Make sure they include that on the Apple dick. TV show. The first thing I'll just be like, wow, is that the best thing you've ever read or what? <laughs> like, <laughs> Competitions over the people. You can all stop writing. <laughs> Exactly. Well, actually, like, you probably me, think about what to read next. Like, you should just read this again. Like, this is the last book you should ever read. Just reread it over and over again until you die. It'll That's just be for Duncan. He'll be the only one who actually reads the thing. He'll be like, I cannot believe I ever Who's this collaborated with this guy, guy on this anything. Asshole. I thought it was. A- <laughs> well, actually, speaking of that, there's there's obviously the difference when you have a physical book and and you can see the cover. Probably there's the name recognition of the author, but what is it? from from your your perspective Hugh and Duncan the thing that grabs your attention about uh, a self published book an ebook or something like that where where is that specific that specific draw coming from cuz it's a lot harder when you're on Amazon or some other other platform mm-hmm. to really think oh wow like this is something new and i just dig into it and figure out what it's all about I'm as for as someone who had terrible cover art for many years. I'm a sucker for great cover art, um, and that will at least get me to start reading the sample. And what I love about Amazon is that yeah. uh, I can sit and read the first few pages um, of any book with, without you know. Uh, you, I, I do it in the uh, browser, not on my Kindle. I actually, will shop through stuff, and you can click the yeah. cover of most self-published books and start reading the first few pages. I know within two paragraphs 
uh, not if it's going to be a great story, but if this person has a voice that I can sink into and and want to read more of. So I would say the first thing I click, the first thing I see is how beautiful the cover art is, just the design and the quality of it makes me think if the person thought that was good, we share some uh, aesthetic mm -hmm. choices. And then uh, once I click, I you know get, I'll give any book a page, and uh, from there it's up to them to decide when I should stop reading. <laughs> and Duncan, what about you? Yeah, it's, I would say it's it, it's it's the old cliche, but you really do judge a book by its cover. The question nowadays is how do you see covers? I mean, I don't go into physical bookstores that that often anymore. It's all used, thumbnails now. Yeah, well, yeah, but also, I mean, you used to. I used to enjoy the experience of going into a bookstore and perusing certain sections and seeing a cover that that I was either familiar with because somebody had mentioned it, or it stuck out, and therefore reading the the back blurb and then reading a couple of pages. Whereas now, I mean, I've got the old school uh, Kindle Paperwhite, so there's no color on it either. So I lose all the cover appeal. Um, but I'm still getting that exposure through Twitter and, and, and reviewers. So I'm seeing, I'm seeing the covers that way. And that's what's, what's kind of cluing me on to go digging. Because um, I, mean, I mean, Amazon suggestion algo seems to be garbage for me as well. So I get suggested. It's, it used to be good for me. I don't know what's happened. I get suggested like, 40 books on the same I think it was a few years account. ago. I get them. Yeah. And nothing it's, else. Something's, something's changed. But I used to, it used to be pretty reliable that if it suggested a book based on my the purchase history, it, was, it worked really well. Yeah, no, I've I've read like I read, I read maybe a th three or four uh, Ellie Modison Junior books a couple of years, a couple of months ago now, and that's literally I. That's all. If I'm going on Amazon shopping, is that's four pages of the suggestions for me, and I have to keep going down to the sixth page to find something different. So, oh, man. no, I yeah, Actually, I, I, I rely on Twitter and, and and the cover to really kind of catch my eye, and then like you said, you read your your first paragraph and then the first page, etc. And if I'm hooked, I'm hooked, and if not, well. We didn't cost blog anything. reviewers, and yeah, reviewers, <laughs> blog reviewers. Yeah. Well, actually, the speaking of the Amazon algorithm, I, I think it's very interesting that obviously Amazon is the biggest platform for self publishing, but it also, uh, contrary to a lot of actually no, I would say traditional publishing is also at the whims of of Amazon. But what do you think of the way that that um, Amazon and other self pub platforms? organize their stuff but also how the algorithms recommend stuff to people and and provide visibility because i think that um causes a lot of confusion for people but it also causes a lot uh, it also contributes to the oversaturation of the market i think because a lot of people are trying to push in order to get into the into the recommendation algorithms good shoes in a sense the thing that I found the funniest of Amazon is literally just the categories you can put your book into to then rise up to be 1,000 in dystopian child <laughs> fantasy tentacle extravaganza <laughs> adventures, and you'll be you know the, the top 100, and then and then that's that's all that people are getting suggested. Um, and then you can call yourself a number one best-selling author. You can. I mean, you don't. I don't think you have a significant number of sales, but it's the. Yeah, I, I think people try game the algorithm, and some obviously succeed quite well. And 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 even Amazon and yourself, like I, I I discovered that you can you can include at least three or four additional categories, but that aren't visible. But if you go through the, the Amazon back end, you can you can you can append those to your book, which means you're then viewed more widely in a in a wider bucket. Um, but none of that's really advertised and, and made aware to the publish you know self published authors. So. It's a lot of that stuff's not clear to publishers. Um, mm. I had a I had a crazy email chain with uh, one of the major publishers when they got um, just the print rights to one of my books. Uh, they categorized it just in in science fiction, like yeah. that, that was the only the only choice they picked in uh, the Amazon metadata. So I emailed them and said, uh, "You know, great job knowing that this was science fiction, <laughs> but we should choose." <laughs> We should choose as specific a category as possible yes. and choose as, I think, self-publishers at the time got two and major publishers got four. And so that was one of the big things I was excited about when doing this deal. I'm like, we're going to get uh, double the amount of um, categories. And instead, they just chose one. It was just self-publishing. So I emailed them and said, uh, well, I tried to explain, like, uh, let's do you know self-publishing uh, or fiction, science fiction, general adventure. And then the other one general slash hard sci-fi hmm. 
uh, or dystopia. And I, I suggested four of them and they're like, well, you know, we appreciate your suggestions, uh, author, but, uh, uh, we're, we, we, we really see this just as like, just science fiction. And I was like, okay, this is going to take oh, some wow. explaining about parent child relationships with these categories. But I was like, so if you choose one of these specific categories, it's still going to show up in science fiction, which is what you want now, but it's going to show up on two other bookshelves as well. And if we choose four categories, we're talking like 16 total bookshelves we're going to get. And they, uh, I'm going to publish the email chain at some point when I just, uh, name redacted, name redacted. <laughs> yeah. Cause it went back literally like seven times I had to email them and explain what was going on. And then I started just ceasing my agent so that she could see how stupid these people were. And, uh, you, people think like I signed up with a publisher and I don't need to know this stuff. They know it. They knew far less than the most basic you know, KDP self-published author out there about how the largest bookstore in the world worked. But that, was, that was eye-opening. But that's the thing, me. I don't have the incentive. Well, so here's, here's the thing that really authors don't understand when they're making these decisions is that your book at some point is going to be a competitor to your publisher's other books. Yeah. So let's say you've had your year run and the book's not doing great anymore or never did great and you want to reduce it to two ninety nine on ebook just to try to drive some sales. The publisher will never do that because they're releasing a new thing they hope is the big yeah. thing and they're charging twelve ninety nine, and your book is going to compete with their books. So you think your publisher is going to have your best interests at heart, but uh, it doesn't work that way. And so um, those are the kinds of things that I've been vocal about over the years just to get aspiring authors to think kind of more clearly about the long-term ramifications of giving up uh, control of pricing, uh, ownership of your IP, all that stuff to someone else. It's just, uh, it doesn't, the, the economics don't work and the, the psychology of it all doesn't work the way you assume it will. Yeah. Yeah. And in the end, ultimately, you know, as a self-published author, you are your own entity and therefore you're competing with, you're competing with other authors, which makes sense in a competitive market like that. But if one publisher is competing with themselves, you know, I look at some of the, the releases that are coming up this fall because there's a huge wave of stuff that's kind of like a back catalog mm -hmm. from, from pre-pandemic yeah. or at the beginning of the pandemic. And I look at some publishers and I'm just like bewildered by, oh, one month has five, six releases and three of these are fantasy and three are sci-fi. And those come into direct conflict with each other. And ultimately it's just like, putting your money on it on the table and then sliding it over to somebody else to just take away. <laughs> it's like, it's a gamble. That, yeah. Like that, that, that gamble. money is like on the table and then it just kind of disappears just based on the, on the way that you're putting something out into the world. It's like, you're slapping yourself on the wrist, you know, as you're trying to sell people a product. So it's, I think, you know, would you two see self-publishing as, not necessarily an antidote to that, but um, an alternative venue that makes more sense for people who who want to be able to market themselves in a way that seems fair for the for the book that they're producing. I, I think it's a mix between how much ownership you want to retain, how much pain you can endure, and how much you like doing stuff that's not just the pure writing. Um, I mean, if, if, you, if you hate marketing, you hate formatting, you, you can have different issues and you hate looking at pagination and coning, you can have different problems. But if you like that kind of stuff, then I think the benefits probably far outweigh the, the, the cons, et cetera. Like you, you are retaining your rights, you are retaining ownership and creativity, and you're not, um, you're not locking yourself into a contract that might not have your best interests at heart with an organization that you know, we'll, we'll move on from you as soon as you're not out, you know, either you've earned out your contract or you're not earning out your contract and you then need to pay back your advance. Um, like there's, there's pros and cons to both. I mean, the, the stigma is definitely, is definitely going away. It's not gone. Um, I mean, Hugh's been here from the start and I think he'd, he'd attest for far more to that, that there's still a, a level of judgment associated with it, but that's, that I think is just in part, to, in, in, in part due to quality and the fact that anybody can produce a book, but, um, you know, the, the good ones really do kind of differentiate themselves and we need to give more eyeballs to those and just use them as proof of concept that you know, if you 
you want to take a gamble, what you're already doing, consider this and then follow, follow you and myself and people like Michael R. Fletcher as, as test cases and learn from what we did and didn't do. I think too, like we, we talk about self-published authors being in competition with one another. That's true. However you publish the unique thing about self-publishing is that, um, authors actually cooperate heavily, like to the point that they make box sets with other authors and, and share the revenue and make these deals where you get like, you know, 10 books for, you know, five bucks and, and uh, each author kind of piggybacks on the other author's uh, readership to, to get new readers. And you don't, you don't, you don't see anything like that in the traditional publishing world. So I think there's a level of cooperation, sharing uh, marketing tips and, um, uh, all kinds of advice, business kind of advice with each other. Even even ra- oh, sorry. even raising funds. No, go ahead. Yeah, even raising funds though. So one of the big barriers I think to getting any book printed is once you get a book printed, you realize how much it costs <clears> to get a book printed. Um, and even if you're doing an arc run, you know, say you want, I don't know, 500 arcs to give to reviewers, etc., beta readers, whatever. You know, that's that's a significant outlay of, of funding. Um, but you have things like Kickstarter, which I mean, I'm, I'm going to toot my own horn here. I use Kickstarter to fund my arc run. So there are other avenues you can kind of find to diversify costs. And and even using something like Kickstarter gets you an audience immediately. So there, you know, there's, there's, mm-hmm. there's new methods that didn't exist 10 years ago that you can now use for self-publishing to kind of mitigate some of the financial costs that a, a, a traditional publisher would pay for. Um, mm-hmm. And then I yeah, still, you-, you know, you still own your royalties and your rights. So... I, I diversified the cost, but I kept all the benefits and I got an audience at the same time. And it was a nice talking point. So it's, it's, it, as long as you could start thinking inside of the box with the tools that you have and you let your imagination run that gets, yeah, it, it can be really rewarding. It just takes a bit more planning, perhaps. Planning and then effort and follow through. Yeah. 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 But Hugh, Hugh, I like that you mentioned the, beyond the fact that obviously authors are kind of competing with each other for, for sales or market share or whatever, but, but within self-publishing, there exists this collaborative community. And it reminded me of uh, what you said, reminded me of video games. There's a, something called the indie humble bundle, which oh, is, they're, they're so good. It's, it's basically a bunch of indie pub uh, uh, indie developers that come together and they bundle their games under certain categories. A lot of the times they, they release their stuff for charities, etc. But I think despite competition being a part of any market, it's really nice to see self-published authors coming together and <clears throat> viewing each other as, um, you know, potential collaborators or friends or, or just forming a community. And then Duncan, what you said, building on top of that, everybody thinking outside the box and just coming up with new ideas that traditional publishers might not even think of, but wouldn't even dream of trying to experiment with because it's too much of a risk. Yeah, and they, they I've done this with I've had problems with publishers who have some rights that I'm trying to do promotions with. Mm. Their lawyers get involved and they're like, uh, they'll just gum up the works, something that's a no brainer for getting more readers and promoting the work. Like they just don't uh see the advantage to experimenting like that. So I, I had um uh, uh John Joseph Adams tried to get like the first part of Wool in the Wastelands anthology. Uh, part two oh, okay. and the first one did amazing it was one of the great anthologies i've i've ever read love every short story in there and i was just so honored that i would have paid money to have my story in that sequel mm-hmm. and the publisher that had uh because of the uk rights right. um uh, were owned by random house the random house lawyers were like uh you know what's the payment gonna be and all this other stuff and it was just gonna it was gonna take drag on too long that finally John Joseph was like, I, you, we have to like publish without it. And I was trying to explain to these random house people, like, do you guys realize we should be paying them to have our thing included? Are y'all worried about how little they're paying us? And uh, they're just, uh, frankly, complete idiots about some of the marketing decisions. And you don't have, you give up control mm. of stuff like that. So it's uh, really, really frustrating when there's lawyers who aren't working on your behalf who have a say so and what you can and can't do. You can't do free promotions. You can't do price pulsing. You can't do giveaways. Um, it's just a lot to give up. And it's fascinating because it's just, it's just a roadblock, even though you're working with professionals 
who you expect to be professionals, you just end up coming across a whole bunch of legalese and, and stuff that gets in the way of what the ultimate goal is, which is to sell a book, you know, and that is so counterintuitive that it, it blows my mind. It's crazy to go through it. Like you just, you, and, and you can only commiserate with your agents and your spouse and other people and say like, can you believe how stupid these people are? But uh, they're, they're supposed to be working on your behalf and you can't get them to do the, the most common sense thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's why what you two are doing with SPSFC is so, I think, necessary for, for the sci-fi industry, self-published authors, because, you know, it gives them a little bit of a boost um, ahead of the normal learning curve when it comes to marketing and, and promotion and, and, you know, sending out arcs and all that kind of stuff. I think that in and of itself is a really um, beneficial thing to the community. So thank you both for doing that. Yeah, first pleasure. Of all. It's like, it's like field of dreams for me. Like, <laughs> like it's, yeah. it's huge exposure too. Well, but I it's, mean, it's like you, you build it and you hope people will come. And, yeah. <laughs> and, the, and thank you guys. Thank you guys for coming and for being reviewers and Manny building a gorgeous website and for doing uh, interviews like this. I can't wait to see all the interviews with the finalists and other authors and uh, cover artists and other people who are involved. But uh, uh, like Duncan's saying, like uh, he's pretty much built this thing and now so many people are coming and wanting to be a part of it. So. Mm -hmm. to adrian and mandy both like thank you guys mm -hmm. so much and and all the reviewers out there who are part of all the bloggers it's just uh it's such a gift to so many readers and writers that that you're helping people you know out there find each other and find the next great book it's, yeah, well, it's I mean, just a huge service this is something that i found just being so fresh into the into this world but you know, starting at FanFi Addict and meeting all these cool people, it was really immediate to me that uh, these are just genuine down to earth folks who really love science fiction and fantasy and they just want to talk about it. And we developed a community really quickly and, you know, other blogs talk to other blogs and, and bloggers talk to authors and authors talk to authors. And it's just this huge jumbled mess of, of magic that just poops out great conversations and, and <laughs> awesome stuff that, you know, SPSFC started because of Duncan's desire to start something like this, seeing that it didn't exist before. And then well, using the community. Having, having Mark Lawrence to steal the idea from Mike. Exactly. Well, did you actually get permission? No, we did. We him? did. We, we asked okay. him and got his blessing. <laughs> um, so now we got his blessing. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it is lovely that that has been a proof of concept that we could then copy and, and obviously modify. So. SPFC is going to be different from SPFBO just yep. because we're different Easy, people. Easier to say. Easier to say. <laughs> um, and yeah, like it's, it's, this year's a test. It's okay. We oh, actually yeah, I, think I think subspic or spusfic or something like that. Space, we just need to Space pronounce. Force. Almost works. Space Force. Yeah, almost works. We actually, that works really well. We actually Donald, call Trump, it Donald Trump. Will no, I know. That's why I laugh because it's just perfect. Though. Like, it's oh. famous already. We actually call it Spacebo internally and between us at uh, Fenfire Dick. What it's do you like call it? Spaceball? Spa no. <laughs> Spaceball. <laughs> Spacebow. It's probably my French accent that's just coming oh, through Space now. Spacebow. The uh, fantasy. B B so it's like SPFBO, but Spacebow. Yeah. Ours was almost a BO, right. but then it was going to be an SPSFCBO, and we're just like, no. Like it's just, no. Uh, it much. doesn't have a nice ring I to wanna, it. I want to add a new letter every year. Until it makes space balls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Well, You're in Vegas. You don't even have the trophy with you. Because I, that, that's. Uh, oh, oh yeah. Oh, Actually, that, so that is that trophy is sitting on a shelf in uh, my girlfriend's office, and so she just gets to look at it all day. I should get a little plaque made that's like best girlfriend of the universe that just sits on the trophy until we give it away. Then I'll switch it out. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. Oh man. Well, what are you two hoping for the future of SPSFC? I mean, this year, you know, we've got a lot of blogs involved, a lot of people connected, and I think it's already starting out to be a beautiful thing, especially once we see more content rolling in. Mm. But after this year plays out, what are your goals for, for SPSFC in the future? What do you hope from the first year of the competition? <laughs> Learning experience for everybody involved. <laughs> what worked? What didn't yes. work? 
how to how to couch the language um uh, but then also yeah just like how do we how do we get as much interest if not more next year i mean the, the interest overwhelmed me surprised me this year i mean i guess it's been a built-up backlog of people wanting it um but yeah i mean for next year we would love to have more people apply and probably obviously still only enable or allow 300 in just because i mean there's only so many people and then so many so many reviewers and only so much time in the day um but yeah i mean this is something that i think hugh touched on earlier it'd be lovely to see finalists and or winners or even semi-finalists somebody pick up an option an agent a, a deal of some sort um Apple well, TV. Well, that, you know, whether they get approached by a traditional publisher who wants to sign them or they get approached by an agent who wants to uh, sell TV rights, etc., at least have the option that they might not have had before. Um, yes. And then, yeah, like, trophies, trophies and badges aside, I think showing people that there's this route, it's still difficult, but there's another route that you can kind of be discovered on and then find success and have a future writing. Because, I mean... It, it's it, you, you need to pay the bills at the end of the day, which means you need as many eyeballs on your book as possible, and as many people reading your book as possible, which means you need as many people talking about your book as possible, and all of these kinds of competitions help. So if SBSFC keeps doing that, and we just uh, you know our, our our network grows and our impact grows, then then win. I mean, right, success. Yeah, I agree with every every bit of that. Just getting um, more readers. To these authors is like the primary goal. Uh, the secondary goal for me is the community that will develop between the bloggers and the authors and the cover artists. Uh, I, I would love when we start getting back to conventions and um, you know hanging out with each other again. That we just keep bumping into people that we've met through uh, interviews like this and through working together and mm -hmm. reading each other's books, so that uh, we just form more friendships and have more camaraderie. Uh, and I think that's going to happen uh, as well. And I'm really looking forward to, I just got an email today about a book conference that's happening in November that hopefully we'll still go through. Mm -hmm. um, I just can't wait to get back to that mm -hmm. where we're, you know, commiserating and hanging out together in, in person and, uh, you know, uh, catching up. So I think a lot of great friendships are going to form out of this as well. That, that's exciting. And yeah, the I first really round off is on me. Yeah, shot, shot, <laughs> shot. shot. <laughs> let's all go to Let's all go to Montreal and get drunk with Manny. Ah, he can't. I, I don't I, think I, Canada's I, letting Americans in. Are they? Are we, I'm are Canadians. They have to let I, me well, in. I don't know. You're, I mean, hell, I'm Australian, and I can't even get back into Australia unless I quarantine for two months for eight thousand dollars. So that's not happening. Uh, Jeez. Two months. Wow. Sorry, two wow. weeks. Two weeks. Yeah, two, two months sounds good. $4,000 Four thousand dollars a week. Two months. So yeah, in a, in in your hotel room and you can't leave. And I think I would go insane. So wow, you write a book. I uh, you, you probably could. It'd probably be really good for that. But I'd rather do that on an island then. Like if I want to go get yeah. isolated somewhere, take me to Bora Bora. But no, not a yeah, not eight thousand dollars. Yeah, probably cheaper. <laughs> Ridiculous. Oh man. Well, um, thank you both very much. Um. We're going to close out with a, a recommendation from each of you, or as many recommendations as you want to give. Just keep it oh boy. A, little, a little bit reasonable of some self-published authors that you are reading or want to promote, or if you're reading anything Ooh. in general, just uh, let us know. We'll start with Duncan. Um, I, I, I've said his name for three or four times, but <laughs> and I tweet at him pretty much fairly often because he's, he's funnily enough in... He's, he's now in the second time for SPFBO and he's now in the SPSFC, so he's just double dipping everywhere. Um, is Michael R. Fletcher. Uh, read his Blackstone Heart. That's where I got my first intro and then go from there. Um, I think I've got two books left of his and then I'm going to start bugging him for when are you, when are you writing more. Uh, who else have I? I can't think of any else self pub at the moment. Hugh might have somebody. I do have someone. I think um, everyone should check out Duncan Swan's uh, <laughs> novel, Monster. I'm not kidding. I agree. Uh, I agree. It's not only a great book, but um, part of my part of my goal with SPSFC is to make sure that uh, Duncan gets the uh, extra readers that he deserves from being able to compete in this uh, competition that he's he's uh, been the brainchild of. So I think it's completely unfair that you've done all this work 
Uh, it's it's so it's the most selfless thing I've ever seen, where someone wanted a competition to put their book in and decided to create a competition that every book except theirs is is uh, <laughs> well, you, some... is, is eligible for. So uh, that's the opposite of everyone, narcissism. Uh, like Dabex exactly. is everyone listen, backfired. Everyone listen to this. Also, everyone involved in this. If you're an author who got your book in, um, Duncan, what is what does the book go for? Is an ebook right now? Is it six ninety nine? No, yeah, so it's, it's, it's uh, it just wasn't special. The special landed like what two weeks ago, so we're back at full price. Oh, you missed your window. Missed your window, to people, but there'll be an, yeah, it's back to nine ninety nine. I'm sure I'll have another <laughs> okay. one at some point because Amazon lets me do it's that still, whenever I want. It's ten dollars to support the guy who's creating the competition to support so many other authors. Like, just you're doing yourself a favor. You're not doing him a favor. You're not doing me a favor. You're buying a great book. So you're definitely doing me a favor, that's but my, yes, I agree hundred percent with that. But. That's, that's my recommendation. And we'll, we'll put a link to, to Duncan's book in, in the YouTube and the podcast, uh, descriptions. Ah, Hughes, Hughes, Hughes will cut out some picture, He's fine. He's his fine. picture <laughs> as the back leg. <laughs> Don't worry about my book. So you, you watch the TV show. It'll probably be better. <laughs> oh man. Well, actually speaking of the TV show, what can we expect, uh, from you, Hugh and mm. Duncan in the future? Me, I would love a cameo if you can arrange that here. I'll be one of the people sent out there to polish that camera and die in misery and agony. But <laughs> what am I? What have I got coming up? Uh, well, the, the TV shows actually can take up a lot of my time, but I also turned in a sequel to Sand this year that'll come out next year uh, and wrote uh, a memoir that I just um, talked with some people at an audiobook uh, place to make me, they want to have me do the narration and kind of um, nice. package this as a, as an awesome. audiobook adventure. So that's exciting. And then I wrote my first feature film. Uh, oh, was that the ago. screenplay you were working on a couple of weeks ago? Yeah. So that's done. And then uh, last week I heard from someone in TV and they were excited about wool and they said, what are you working on next? And I was like, well, I don't have any new books coming out, but I have an idea for a show. And I, sent them this pitch document that I've been working on for years and they were like done we're doing a deal and I had the, I had a call with them today about it nice and Congrats. I I was like you know everyone just blows hot air but uh we did we did, we did a call today and they were like we're it was like four people on the call it was like really surprised me and they were like we're doing this and I'm like sure I don't believe you but that sounds awesome <laughs> And then, I, and then as soon as I got off, like an hour later, my agent called and she was like, so what's this thing I'm doing a deal on? <laughs> so I guess they've, they've made an offer on this thing that I like sent off in an email uh, a couple weeks ago. So now I've got to write a pilot to a new TV show that I just pitched a couple weeks ago. That's awesome. Um, Good problem to have. So, That's a really nice problem Yeah, I could keep creating more work, but it'll never get made anyway. So. Uh. Fingers crossed, you. Fingers crossed. <laughs> you should put that in your tagline uh, it, on, your, on your website. It's never It'll gonna never get, get made, made anyways. It's a it's like my most popular Twitter thread that I've ever written. This whole thread about like how to manage expectations mm. in in, uh, in Hollywood and the uh, it's worked wonders for me. But every every stage of the adventure, you should assume this is the apex and enjoy it for what it is, and never expect the next step to come along. And boy, it's such a uh, someone on a we did a table read of the first two uh, episodes of Wool yesterday, so I got to hear like the whole cast actually read the lines for two whole episodes. And um, so at, at the intro, someone was just talking about how this project's been in development hell, and I just corrected them. I was like, "This has been development heaven. Like every <laughs> everything that didn't work out was me in the room with someone who was like more interesting and creative than I am, talking about a world that I made up when I was." selling books in a little bookstore in North Carolina. So it's been heaven every step of the way. That's amazing. But that's been my attitude towards it all. And yeah, it's, it's a very pragmatic attitude. And I think that's the kind of attitude that you need getting into Hollywood, especially. And Duncan is obviously going to tell us about how his book is being optioned for TV. Oh, or movie. Yeah, one day, one day, <laughs> no, one day. Yeah. <laughs> one, one day we'll see. I mean, that's, well, I, I, you've got, I, you've got volume two coming out. Well, that's least. it. If, if I can, if I can, if I can deliver and meet expectations, then I might start pipe dreaming a bit more. But in the meantime, I'm like, I, I just want to live up to expectations and, and keep writing to the point where I'm confident in writing and, and can keep a roof over my head, etc. Um, I also think that if, personally, a, a movie of Monster would be terrible, but an HBO miniseries might be great. So I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> 
So this is uh, from David Walters. He just wanted to, mm. to thank you for, uh, for wool, but the reasoning is very beautiful and I wanted to read this to you. So this is from David, who we call Boss David. He wants to say, Hugh, thank you for being my springboard into everything fiction. Wool astounded me in so many ways. And without that key book in my life, none of what I've accomplished in the book community would have been possible. From the bottom of my heart, thank you for jumpstarting my love of science fiction and fantasy. I don't even know how to process that. That's incredible. Um, wow. Uh, well, thank you, Dave. Like I, you, you're doing more for uh, literature than I've done. Like it's just uh, such a great platform to spread the love of uh, of genre to so many other people. So uh, really kind words. Can't process it, but that that means a lot. Yeah. So thank you both, Duncan, Hugh, for SPSFC, for the amazing books that you've written. In Duncan's case, book, and I can't wait to read. Can't wait to can't wait to read volume two. But honestly, you guys are doing great work, and and we're excited to work with you in the future. Um, we're excited to see what you do in the future. We'll be and fine. read and, all and uh, read all the three hundred authors that yeah. we just landed exactly. in in our uh, Kindles. Yeah, but you guys have some work to do. Uh, my work is almost done now. I just get to manage the small fires that pop up occasionally. Still, still, every every bit helps, mm. and we're very appreciative for what you guys are doing for self publishing. Yeah. And I agree. We're excited to see. Yes, mm. we're excited to see where SPSFC goes in the future. All right. Onward well, and upward. Thank, thank you guys so much. Thanks for having thank us. It's been lovely. Well.